All right, all right. Just gonna allow a couple more, allow people to come in if they're free. And then I'll do a video on a few things and I'll put up a, uh, we got somebody in here right now. Hello, hello. Hello. Yo, what's going on up? Good, good. Oh, it's not video. Okay, you're not on video? Oh uh, yeah, hold on. Let me uh get my video up. <laughs> okay, there you go. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Great. Watching the snow come down. Oh, it's snowing? Oh, snap. Okay. Oh, okay. I see it now. Yeah. It wasn't changing crazy. Maybe I didn't do my uh, video. Wait a minute. Okay, there. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, so um, yeah, I haven't done these in a minute, but I just want to go over just some of the basics with people, and I'm going to put up a replay of this after we're done. So... I'm gonna talk about the current state of the market, um, how I do technical analysis, how I read charts, how I come up with like buy zones, sell zones and whatnot. And then um, some of the ways I've been playing options on some of the uh, bigger ETFs. You're gonna be making recommendations too, right? Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. And I have a screenshot of some of the ETFs that I have in my portfolio right now. Um, I have one portfolio, which is pretty much like one that I play around with like high risk. And then I have another one that's more like a long-term growth portfolio. Uh, so let me get a screenshot of this. We're one. most interested in the high risk because we have the long -term. <coughs> Yeah. All right, one second. Okay, I'm about to share a screen real quick. Are right, you guys see my screen? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll start off um, for all the people that will be watching. Um, this is just a little overview of the market, the way I'm uh, approaching it, some like basics to keep in mind as you start your investing journey some tips and tricks to keep in mind if you're seasoned already, some things that I've been learning along the way as well. Um, so here's a little snapshot of the majority of my portfolio. Um, now I have like some other stocks in there um, that are probably more like aggressive uh, stocks, like growth stocks. And then these are more like my long-term holdings. So mm -hmm. um, when I first got into the stock market, these are some of the suggestions that I got from different channels and they've been serving me well. So um, so the first six you can see on here, they all start with a V and these are some of the Vanguard ETFs. Now, you know, you have mutual funds and then you have exchange traded funds or ETFs. The mutual funds being, um, the funds are pretty much like a, a basket of all- Basket, these, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basket of all these different stocks. Uh, you have a lot of blue chip stocks. You might have some growth stocks here and there, but you have them hinged around a bunch of big boy blue chick stops the same way you would have a mall with like a, a apple store or like nordstrom like you have your long-term constant they're always going to be there so the first one on my list that i picked up is called vti uh you can you see my mouse moving around it yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. the first one i have is vti is called the vanguard total stock market etf and that's uh a broad-based ETF that has a lot of uh, stocks in it, such as uh, Microsoft, Apple, Procter & Gamble, some of the big boy ones. And I can bring up my Weeble uh, thing right here to show you guys real quick. So this is, um, this is, uh, tech, right? This is what? This is Vanguard Tech. No, I have, I have one that's tech, um, but this is... Oh, this is total total stock market okay so this gives you really good coverage um this one is given an annual return of about 33 33 percent over the past 10 years so 
and even with so I'll I'll take you to um some of the particulars on this one. Let's see, here we go. Yeah, I got this set up here. I have like a whole bunch of different screens that I kind of like look at to monitor the stocks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so here's VTI. Let's go to holdings. Well, I can't find where to bring it up now, but um, I, off my phone, um, I know they have Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google, a lot of the, the big stocks that are really going to hold you afloat when there's a lot of volatility in the market. Um, secondly, one big thing to look at is expense ratio. So how much they're charging you for every share of the, the stock or ETF that you buy. So Vanguard typically has low expense ratios. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read this off of my phone right now. So VTI, the stock price is $212. The expense ratio is 0.03%. So they're charging mm -hmm. you three cents for every $1,000 worth of the stock that you have. So that's really, really good. That is good. Good. Yeah. Um, and they give you a dividend of 2.9. So $2.93 every i think uh three months mm. so that's a yield of 1.38 percent mm -hmm. um i'll have to double back to see if that's quarterly or annually but the the, the dividend is uh last one was on december 27th so i've got uh, quite a few uh kickbacks and dividends from vti so those are two good things the dividend and the expenses on vti and then third uh i'll go back to um, the asset all allocation and the top 10 holdings are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, which is Google, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Berkshire Hathaway, you know, Warren Buffett's, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Tesla, Visa. So they have a lot of really, have, they're heavily weighted in a lot of stocks that have been uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, stable even throughout mm -hmm. the pandemic, right? <laughs> You, know, yeah. you might have one like Tesla that, that may have a low volatility, but is it's clearly trending upward and they always have good press releases. They they beat their earnings estimates more often than not. And then they just have good solid fundamentals. So to everybody that's going to see this playback, you want to you want to see um, good solid fundamentals, whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund or just a regular stock, you want to make sure the fundamentals are sound. So even when the price fluctuates, you don't get freaked out when things are going bad for you or you don't get too ahead of yourselves when the price is flying up. Like you, you have a good sense of how the stock is going to operate. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the three things that I looked at when I picked out VTI, even on top of the, you know, the original suggestions that, that were given to me. Um, and then the fourth thing is looking at the amount of return that this fund has historically given. So if I, so if I go to performance on my phone for VTI, and this is all in the Weeble app. Um, there are a lot of good brokerages, Fidelity, Weeble, TD Ameritrade. I would not suggest Robinhood, but if you do, um, it can be found there as well. Um, you can find the performance of these different funds. And for VTI, since its inception in 2001, it has returned 444% over 20 years. So that's about uh what 20 percent per year wow um, over 10 years it has given a return of 277 percent so that's been, that's been brought down because of the pandemic but even in the past three years pandemic included we've had an annual three-year return of 60 percent so 20 percent per year that is really good right so if if you had nothing else in your portfolio you had bti you would have been able to ride out this turbulence pretty well as long as you kept slowly adding to to your your holdings every every month every couple months you slowly keep adding to the pot you know so so you would you you would be reinvesting your dividend right absolutely and um how much more would you and I mean, the, this 20% per year, this performance, what does the performance include? That just that just includes how much the stock price has risen. As, as, as appreciated? 
Yes. Oh, okay. So that's it. Wow. That's it. So I'll bring the chart up and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, let me zoom out here. It's another lesson for everybody. When in doubt, always zoom out. Um, <laughs> let's see. So I'll zoom out here to the weekly chart. Okay, or let's go monthly. All right, so you can see over here, this is 2010 and the stock price was sitting around 50, $60. And you can see now it's all the way up near 212 here in 2022. So you can see how far it's appreciated, right? Over 10 years. And then over three years, Let's go back to January, March. That's right here. Uh, 2019, the price was around $141. And the price mm -hmm. now is $212. So, yeah. Right? So that's a big difference in three years. Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty much what that is. It's showing you the appreciation from point A to point B, whether it's three mm -hmm. years or one year. And that's giving you the percentage that is grown from price A to price B. So now um, when you said you're talking about the pandemic, uh, how about the, uh, the war that's having an impact as well. So the market has been pretty much, well, it's been all over the place, but um, can we say that it's been going down? Absolutely. Yep. So, are we anticipating a bottom or what? So this is the way I read into it. Um, I think you always have sell-offs after um, the holidays, like right before tax season, people kind of like sure. sell, right? <laughs> to kind of like uh, decrease the amount they want to come out of pocket. So right here, you you, you saw it right after January uh, 7th, 31st, this is this red bar. You can see it dip, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um and I'm gonna get into why I draw these lines. So you see a, a slow but steady downtrend. Now this was happening even before we got the news of the, the build up to the war with, with Ukraine mm -hmm. and Russia, because uh, one of the big things was the instability in the, um, with the federal tax rate with the, with the Fed. So that was something that caused a big uh, level of concern and, and unrest uh, among investors because Jerome Powell, who, who's the head, uh, the chairperson mm -hmm. of the Fed, they kept saying we're going to increase interest rates. We're going to increase interest rates. Yeah, but we and didn't. Never, yeah. And they never did. They've been saying it didn't that, happen, right? Yeah, right. And people were just like, "Well, we don't know when it's going to happen, so we need to kind of like sell off and kind of like hedge our bets against you know potential inflation." So that's inflation is really the thing that's been kind of like turning the the market on its head, right? And that's that's everyone's fear. So that's one of the big reasons why cryptocurrency has been one of the ways of people hedging their bets against inflation because it's not mm -hmm. backed by any type of um, dollar or or gold or silver, any type of, of anything currency. tangible, right? Yeah, and it's not centralized. Like no one entity mm -hmm. controls it. No one govern, government controls it. And that's both the beauty and the danger of it, right? It's a deregulated market, but then at the same time, the question is, can you apply regulations quicker than the technology outpaces you, right? So that's that's kind of where cryptocurrency is at because you have some of these cryptocurrencies that have tangible, uh, what would you say, uh, applications for the cryptocurrency and then others like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is like a, a hold of, of um, value, but it's no tangible real life applications for Bitcoin, right? Whereas with something like Ethereum, there are, tangible applications for it like if you looked at any um boxing matches or nba games uh or there are like i think the houston rockets game you can pay for concessions with dogecoin right mm -hmm. so like or ethereum or you can buy jerseys with ethereum but you can't do that with bitcoin so you're starting to see real world applications but not enough yet but back to the the major point is that inflation the uncertainty with the, the interest rate, those are two things that are, are in creating volatility and uncertainty in the market. So you are starting to see that cause a downtrend in the market. And then the advent of war just further made people uncertain. A lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
So those are three of the things that were leading to this downtrend, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, so me, like I, I tend to zoom out and I draw trend lines. I, um, this is one point that I wanted to get to for everything, everybody. I draw lines. I look for trends. I, I try to draw lines of support where I tend to see the price bounce off of. And I try to draw lines of resistance where I see the, the price go up to and then face resistance. Mm. And I, I, I look, I, I kind of zoom out. Let me go to my daily chart. And I, I look for, for price points where I see like, okay, here's one time it bounced off of this price. And boom, it's doing it again. So I'm going to draw a trend line here, right? And that can give me, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can get an idea of where's a loading zone where people see it pull back to this price and they're just like, okay, this is a price where I'm going to load up that. And you, you can kind of see that, let's say this price, 208. You see it pull back to 208, boom. It mm -hmm. not all people are putting in uh, limit orders or to buy in at that price. Right, you might have a bunch of people that have a limit order for let's say two hundred and nine dollars. Like they, they may have 2,500 2, orders, and you might see another one for five hundred orders. So you have all these orders. Like if the price pulls back here, I want the computer to automatically buy me these many shares at this price. And that's when you tend to see like these strong bounces off of these supports. And it, it went up, it hit resistance right here, one time, pulled back, hit it again, pulled back. And then it came right back down to this line of support and bounced right back off. So I, I tend to look at different levels and I'll draw multiple lines of support and resistance. And it kind of gives me like different zones to, to look for um, breakthroughs when, it, when a price might shoot up into an uptrend or breakdowns when it breaks down through a line of support and goes down and, and confirms a downtrend. And there are other things I look into like candlestick patterns and whatnot and i'll save that for a different episode because you know that'd be too much for one time but i i like to use multiple different uh indicators whether that be looking at the candlestick patterns whether that be analyzing my levels of support and resistance whether you see these color lines right here pink blue green mm -hmm. these are like the moving averages so one is like the nine day moving average the other one is like the 20 day moving average in green this is the 50 day moving average. And then this red one is 200 day moving average. So I can see how the price moves based off what the average has been over a certain time span. Certain time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can use, so like the, the patterns, the levels of resistance and report support, the moving averages, uh, and then these technical indicators down here, I kind of combine all four things and, and then make a judgment call on whether I think that there's a strong chance for it to trade sideways or that, or go into a trend one way or another. So um, those, those are some of the things I use. I'll go more into the, the depth of like technical analysis on, on the next uh, episode, but that's just so you guys have an idea that I'm just not like throwing darts to the board and just like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. making guesses, right? It's, you know, these are, these are all very educated guesses. Nothing's foolproof, but you're making very educated guesses. And, um, and again, I, with those patterns, moving averages, what were the other two? Uh, moving averages, candlestick patterns. Candle? Like candlesticks. Okay. So these candlesticks here, um, just as a brush up, they show you where the price has opened and closed at during the day or whatever time frame you're looking at them on. So we're on a daily time frame. So each candlestick corresponds to where the price opened and closed at on that particular day. Okay. okay? So a red candlestick, um, you would look at the top where of, of this rectangle and that's where the price opened at, right? And then the bottom of this red rectangle is where the price closed at during that day. Mm. So I put, put my mouse over this candlestick so you can see it opened up at 212. And then you can see next to the, the letter H, if you look up, then it, it uh, closed, I mean, next to the letter C, it closed at 209. So it opened up at 212 and closed about $3 lower than it opened up at. Hmm. And, you, and you can see okay. also these wicks at the top and the bottom, they show how high the price went during that day 
and then how low the price went during that day. So it shows the fluctuation in between the opening and the closing price. So the price opened up at $212.94. It went as high as $213.63. It dropped as low as $209.21 and then it eventually closed 41 cents higher at $209.61. So it just Okay, so that was the third one. What was the fourth one? The fourth one would be these technical indicators below. So the one, one of them that I use is a pretty good one. And I'll bring up my, um, my presentation here is called the MACD. So it's called the Moving Average Convergence Divergence. Mm. And, and to break that down in simple terms, it's pretty much an average of the 12 day and a 26 day moving average. So the way that you would use this is this, um, this yellow line uh, would be, let's say that would be your 12 day moving average. And this blue line would be the, um, the six line or the 26, right? Mm -hmm. So when you, when you see this yellow line kind of turn, yeah, exactly. turn oh. it and then cross over this six, 26 day moving average, that would indicate to you that you might be going to an uptrend. And okay. you can see that matching up with the chart. You can see as the chart's rising, you're starting to get strength here. And that's matching with the MACD crossing over the 26 day estimated move average, moving average. Um, nothing is foolproof, but in general, that's the trend. And then when you see this go up and then it starts to, the trend starts to reverse and it starts to break back down under the 26 day moving average, then you start to see some weakness. Right, so that's the that's the general idea. It's a very simplified, yeah. boiled, boiled down down explanation. I mean, there's there's obviously more nuance to that, but that's the basic idea of it. It can give you a, a pretty good gauge of when a trend is starting to reverse. So, like, let's mm -hmm. say you're in a downtrend. Um, here's here's a, a a way to kind of think about it. Um, higher highs and and higher lows typically signal and uptrend so you have the price go up and it drops okay down. yeah yeah that makes sense right? and then it goes up to a higher high comes back down mm -hmm. but it's uh it stops here that's a higher high. and then mm -hmm. right the price is fluctuating but there are higher highs and higher lows and that signals an uptrend uptrend right and the exact opposite here you can see a lower high and then a lower low and that would signal a downtrend right so let's say here, for example, you see it's higher high, higher low, and then it stops here. Now let's say you had, it went down and you got another peak right here. That would signal, hmm, okay, maybe this thing is starting to peter out at this price. And then let's say it might reverse on you and go to a, uh, a, a lower high. Then you're like, okay, this thing is starting to reverse the trend and you're starting to see a downtrend now. So this is just like some of the simple concepts where you can kind of try to um, That's nice. like yeah, that. like indicate the, the direction, right? Right. So, like for example, if you look at this channel, this is an ascending channel, right? And you see the price higher, higher, uh, high, lower, low, higher, high. I mean, higher, high, higher, low, higher, high, higher, low, higher, high, and then for whatever reason, they're selling pressure and it breaks this channel, this trend line that you've drawn. You, you find three points on here and you can see it trending upward. This price, for some reason, it, it broke this channel. Then you're like, hmm. Go to that floor. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then, for example, this might have been one of the levels of resistance, I mean, support that I drew. So not only did it, dro it drop through this, break this, uh, this trend line on the channel, but now it broke through our resistance, our support line. And that's almost confirming like, okay, this thing is not just a false signal. It's really um breaking well, mm -hmm. uh support and then shooting down to a, a, a lower low so that that those are some of the things that you kind of like you, you look at over and over through repetition over time you start to notice these little trends right um and i'll put up a i don't know maybe i'll i'll put up like a I'll put up a replay of this video so you guys will be able to see like a, a, mm -hmm. a picture of this. And I'll put this up in the chat too. Um, 
so those are some of like the the basic concepts that I use to kind of to figure out where I think a price will be at and which direction is moving at. So I'll give you guys an example of how I played some options this past week. Uh, let's see. So these are some options that I uh, an option that I played this week. To your point, we saw weakness in the market, and you have um, call options where that means you are betting that the price is going to go up. You have put options where you're betting that the price is going to go down. And um, I'll go through this this quickly because we only have about 10 minutes because um, of, of the Zoom rules for three people. But um, here is, let's say, let's say this, this is also similar to the SPY chart. This is VTI, but this is similar to what the chart looked like when I was looking at it um, mm -hmm. on, I think this was Tuesday. And I had um, certain levels of support and resistance drawn out, right? So let's say right around here where my, my, where my mouse is, is where the price opened up at. And during the night when I'm analyzing the chart, I'll look at call options and put options. And I'll say, okay, if the price opens up and it goes through to this level of resistance and possibly pushes through, then I'll look for call options with a strike price that are sitting a little bit higher because now if it breaks through my line of uh, resistance and it and it hold it goes through that line with strength. Then I know okay this this is a confirmation of an upward direction. And then opposing that, if the price drops through this line of resistance, I mean this line of support, and it and it goes down and it heads down towards my next line of support. Then I'm like okay this is my price target for a put option. So let's say this price was mm, 40, 4100 and this this line up here is 40, 4,200, and this line down here is 4,000. So I'm like, if it goes to 4,100 or 4,200, then I'm going to look for call options maybe at, at 4,300, maybe $100 higher, because now I have confirmation of volume coming in that's going to be pushing that price up to this, this level. And then conversely, if I see heavy volume coming in and it pushes this price down below this line of resistance that I'm going to look for put options at this lower level of resistance that I've already drawn out. So I'm not thinking these things on the fly. I've already thought these things mm -hmm. out the right before. Mm -hmm. So I looked at put options for the uh, bigger version of the SPY, which is called SPX. Um, they give you better premiums and so on and so forth. I won't go into all the Greeks and all, all the details for the options, but um, just know that this had a low volatility. So this, this, um, this contract won't get crushed if the price spikes quickly in one direction or the other. And it gives me a good return, about $6 for every price that the stocks moves. Every dollar that stock moves, I get $6.62 if it moves down every dollar. Um, so I noticed volume coming in, and this is in the middle, it's called an order book. So Rebull offers the level two NASDAQ order book. So it shows you all the orders that are coming in in real time. So for example, the numbers are not important, but let's say my price is lower than this, this price right here. And there's a lot of shares that are, are being put in at one time to say if the price rises up here, then we're going to push the price right back down. We're going to sell a thousand shares and push it right back down. So I'm seeing this in real time and I'm getting a gauge for, okay, if the price gets to a certain point, this might be a level of resistance. There are a lot of sell orders. And conversely, I'll look on the buy side of things, which is in green, and see where are all the buy orders at. So I can kind of see, okay, where's everybody going to sell at and where's everybody going to buy at? So I can get an idea on how much leeway I have for how far the price can drop, right? Sometimes you'll get fake orders, right? You'll see a thousand pop up and then disappear. So sometimes I'll try to do the okie doke on you. So like, you know, with time and experience, you'll kind of like get the feel for what's real and what's probably not real. Like if you see, if you see an order for a thousand or fifteen hundred, that might be viable. But if you see an order for ten thousand, that might be BS, right? So just this can give you a gauge for the volume that's coming in and what price targets people have in their minds where they're going to buy and sell. So I saw a lot of selling pressure and not a lot of buying pressure. Um, so I went in for a couple of puts. I ended up making about $47. I sold both of them 
within like a five minute time span, like a quick scalp. And then I got, I got in, I got up, I got out. Right. Um, eventually uh, these went uh, back down to about a uh, hundred dollars per, uh, per mm. uh, contract because mm. then the buying pressure come in, came in and pushed it all the way back up to my uh, original level that it opened up at. So, you, you know, you have to know, you have mm -hmm. to look at the volume, you have to look at the price, look at your levels of resistance, look at your trends and kind of like get a gauge on when to get in and when to get out. Um, so if, if nothing else sticks from this episode, the uh, the trends, like the four points of indication that I mentioned, and then volume, mm -hmm. volume, 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 and volume. <laughs> volume mm -hmm. tell you a lot, whether that's on a daily chart, minutely chart, weekly chart yearly chart it will tell you everything about what people are thinking where this is going to go so okay um that's it for this episode i'll put i'll put this um i'll put a picture of this up in the chat but these are some resources that i use when i'm doing like research on different stocks or what the mm -hmm. market's doing at the moment so i'll throw these up in there and then next time i'll actually go more in depth about what an option contract is um what how to find a price level on a stock and then when to if you want to do things in the short term when to get in when to get up when to get out and then if you want to do things on the long term um when to find a levels that are a good buying opportunity you know getting yeah. at your price and then yeah. Yeah. i'd be interested in your the rest of you started with uh, telling me what your holdings were so i'd be interested in knowing what the rest of your holdings were Right, I'll put this um, up in the yeah, chat. Put that up. Yeah, I'll put I'll repost this in the chat. But my okay. main holdings are these top six, and they're mm -hmm. Vanguard ETFs. Um, the one is VTI, and that's total stock market. The other big one I have is VOO, and that's the S and P five hundred, the top five hundred mm -hmm. um, blue chip stocks in the stock market. Those are the two big boys that I have. And then um, you guys can look at the other um, four that have V in front of them, but uh, briefly, they are utilities, information technology, which you alluded to before. Another one is a real estate ETF. And then uh, my last one is a high dividend ETF. So those are some of the uh, the big boy ETFs that I have to, to anchor my foundation. Great. Uh, so I'll throw those up in the chat. And in the next episode, I'll go over the other ones uh, in this top six in detail and then talk about how to determine when is a good time to buy and then how to determine what is a good investment. All right. All right. Have you ever thought about opening your own shop? Uh, when I get good enough, man. <laughs> you may already be there. All right. Well, I just want to say that uh, part of the, the interest is that I've heard um, that there's going to be a transfer of wealth. Yeah. And so recognizing that not only is by chance, but also by skill too. So the skill set that you're communicating, um, we just want to get in and commend you, but we want to be a part of what's going on. <laughs> yeah, actually, never mind. I, I think we are good because I'm. You guys are on one screen, so it's not the the rule is if you have a basic account and you have three people, then after forty minutes, it'll cut you off. Oh. But we are three people in two channels, so we're fine. So never mind. I'll keep going. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, to your point, yeah, there is a transfer of wealth because you can go on Google or YouTube, like these are things that anybody can learn, right? So Thanksgiving of 2020, I didn't even really know what a stock was. Um, I, I, I kind of had some people start getting me interested in it and I just started looking it up. What is a stock? What is the stock mm -hmm. market? what is this what is that and you just kind of uh snowball from there right um and now you have all these people that can they don't have to go to a financial advisor or or a certain club to learn these things these aren't secrets that are exclusive to a fraternity right anybody can find these things out with the click of a mouse so it changes the game right and all these things that I'm throwing out, these terms, technical indicators, blah, blah, blah. They can sound complicated, but all these things are very simple concepts. And in my opinion, 
a lot of these things are made to sound complicated to discourage people from mm -hmm. how straightforward it is, how simple it is. You just have to put in the time and the due diligence just to educate yourself. But these are not difficult things to learn on your own. Like if you just intuitive by nature, you, 15, 70, 30, some background in math, no background in math, doesn't really matter. You can, anybody can look these things up and familiarize themselves with it. It's a way professionals um, protect themselves by using technical jargon, as you say, that is engineers do it, accountants do it. Um, and when, you know, as you say, it's, it, it's simple. You just got to get around the language. And if you don't get the basic information, then what you're, what you're going to be inundated with is various research um, houses telling you, well, I've got it. Give me a uh, hundred dollars a month. Uh, 200. I mean, just so they can tell you what you are already explaining if you can look at it. But many people do not have the A, the time to do it. You put in a lot of time just in even uh, making yourself familiar with what is going on even in the averaging and how all that takes place. But really, uh, they, and so then the, there's so many that you know, is somebody's got to be lying up in here. <laughs> <laughs> buy this, buy that, you know, and I know this and I've done this for 20 years and I've recommended I've never been wrong. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a bunch of hooey here. So <laughs> you really just have to know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, there's a lot. Of, I get about a half a dozen different um, uh, notices every from from the same um, salesman. I'll say yeah, basically is what they yeah. are, and then they tell you, you know, they want to sign you up for um, to listen to this person, yeah. and they tell you that person has had the best performance over. Well, everybody oh, couldn't yeah, have had the yeah. the best performance over this time frame. And, and uh, so, and of course, you haven't heard of the names, but uh, yeah. 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 So um, me personally, I, I have one, I have a couple people that um, I think are really good channels and I'll put them up in the chat. Um, one that I really like that really st has st stood out is uh, Keenan Grace. Um, he has, he has a discord, which is like a server where um, for, for his service, five hours a month and um, the amount of knowledge and um, five yeah, mm -hmm. you can give more if you want, but five dollars and the amount, amount of mm -hmm. knowledge and insight that he's given everybody in that chat is just incredible. Like I learned a lot about like options trading just from looking at even his unpaid videos. Like you can just open up a video on YouTube and he's showing you step What's by step. What's his name? Keenan Grace. It's a Keenan. moniker. It's not his real name, but that's, mm -hmm. that's his YouTube name. Keenan Grace. K E N A N G R A C E. Hmm. And he, nice. mm -hmm. he does a really good job at explaining what the stock market is, um, how to get into it, how to um, how to pick a stock, like how to fundamentally break it down. Are they a good company? Do you believe in them? If you don't believe in them, don't invest in them because you'll end up, you know selling at a loss because you don't believe in the company, right? You know, very fundamental things that have nothing to do with money but are going to make or break you as mm -hmm. an investor or even in anything in life. If you don't believe in it, why would sure. you put your, invest your time and energy behind it? All right, um, show, he, he has um, a course in there showing you how to trade options, like down to the, the, the minutia, when to get in, when to get up, when to get out, how to read the different... Um, how to read the different things on an option chart to see if it is an, a good option, how to draw lines of resistance and support. I learned a lot of that from him. And um, it's one thing to hear, it's another thing to have it work out, right? You see it work in real time. So, you know, for example, let's say Lucid Stock, that's a car company, right? They have the Lucid Air, you know, they're, they're a rival for Tesla, electric car company. And the way the price has been fluctuating, the levels of support and resistance that I've drawn, the price has like trended almost perfectly with the levels of resistance and re support that I've drawn about a week ago. And it's not like I'm predicting these things, like I have a crystal ball, but it's like, wow, like 
I'm actually thinking through this in a stepwise process and the price is actually in the ballpark of where I think it's going to be based off the way I'm reading okay. the chart, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you see that happen with stock A, B, C, D. And you're like, okay, this is something that is, uh, this is something that works, all right? So you, you, you have to know that you're going, you have to accept that you're going to lose sometimes, right? Same thing, like I always make parallels to boxing. You can't be a boxer if you're afraid of getting hit. It's just part of the game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, your your job is to not get hit hard and get hit way less than you hit me. Right. Then you, right? hit me. Mm-hmm. you will take a loss. You have to make sure that your loss is pale in comparison to your wins. That's just the name, name of the game. But if you think you're going to get into the stock market and never lose, that's not how life works, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, you just have to make sure that you you make very educated guesses so that your losses do not outweigh your wins. You have a, a you know. Otherwise, a, it's called gambling. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. There are some gamblers in here, right? There's a difference between um, looking at a stock or doing an option on something that you have researched very well versus jumping into a speculative play like GameStop or AMC or any of these other meme stocks. You see what I'm saying? And people are like, hey, my barber told me this, it's like you're saying, like my barber told me this is a good stock, so I'm going to jump into the pool head first and I don't even check to see if there's water in the pool yet. Like, mm, my, my. Mm-hmm. we don't advocate doing that. Don't be a crash test dummy. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, think these things through and know the risk. If you want to take something that's high risk, then you also accept that you may lose and you accept that risk up front as opposed to just being oblivious and then if something bad happens and you're just like, oh, I'm done with the stock market and this is all gambling. It's like, no, inform yourself, get your feet wet first, and then learn what the risk and the reward is. And then carefully plan out your moves before you take them. Because anybody goes into any move, options, long-term play, short-term play without a plan, you're setting yourself up for failure. If you do go in with a plan, you're setting yourself up for success. Hmm. even if you don't get it early on, if you keep doing the, the proper things that you should do, just like with playing baseball, sometimes you hit the ball hard and you hit it right to an outfielder. But if you're hitting the ball the way you should every time, eventually those hard uh, line uh, out to the outfielder will eventually turn into singles, doubles, then home runs. You just have to be patient and actually come hmm. up with a game plan that will work for you and actually Good. trust and believe in that game plan. Hmm. So here on the channels, I finally found it. This is like for the SPY, for example, you can see the rate of return for a month, three months, all the way up to 10 years, right? And it gives you an idea of what the return will be on an annual and semi-annual basis versus something, let's say you found an ETF where the return was, uh, I don't know, maybe 1% or maybe negative 6% over the, the past year or two years. Then you'd be like, hmm, me- I have to be wary about that. Do I really want to jump into that play? Do I believe in this ETF? What's the expense ratios and so on and so forth. So you can kind of like get the car facts for each stock and see, does this make sense or does this not make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, here's a screen. Well, it's not showing it right here, um, but you can see my screen right here. Um, it says order flow. That's how you can see the amount of large scale medium scale and and small scale orders that are being put in to either buy or sell that stock. You can see this tab for the news, right? So the news, all the things that have been going on, you can scroll down and and just see things of interest. You can see see here financial statements, like how much um, they're making per share. Are they beating the estimates that the analysts are giving them quarterly? You can see, uh, the analysts, they'll tell you the price targets for the ETF or stock. You can see uh, institutional holdings, how much each the big institutionals are holding. That's another big thing to do. Uh, when you want to know what's going to happen short-term or long-term, look at what the big dogs are doing. Are the big dogs scooping up shares at a certain price? Like when the price pulls back, like we're seeing now, um, when everybody's like freaking out, like, oh, this price is dropping, look at the big dogs. Look at the 13F filings and seeing what they're doing Every three months, as the price dropping and all of a sudden you're seeing an order for 100,000 shares, are you seeing a sell order for 100,000 shares? You look at what the big dogs are doing and 
Mm -hmm. They might say one thing in the news right here, but if their actions are saying something different, then you have to really look further into what's going on and say, okay, they're, they're telling me all this, but yet you're spending your money and buying up a stock at this price. Mm, I'm going to look at your actions, not necessarily. What you said, man. Right. Um, you can see here short interest. So short interest will tell you, let's say if you have 100 million shares of a stock on the market and 20 million shares are being borrowed and sold, that means that 20 million shares are being shorted. If you're borrowing and selling those shares that you don't own, that means you are shorting those shares, right? So the short interest will tell you the amount of shares or the total shares that are being shorted. So companies with high short interest, those are the ones that people tend to circle on their wish list because especially in times of uncertainty like now, like a pandemic, famine, war, uh, inflation, when those things happen, banks tend to not want to loan out as much during times of uncertainty. During times of uncertainty, banks and financial institutions tend to say, hey, we don't know when our next meal is going to come from. We don't know if people are going to pay back their loans. So you guys that borrow stuff, we need you to pay that back. So the shares you borrow, we're going to need you to buy those back now. You've had your time, right? And that's when you tend to see these short squeezes, especially when the price has been pushed so low and then you have a time of uncertainty where they have what's called a margin call and these big hedge funds have mm -hmm. to buy back all the shares that they borrow, that buying pressure typically will send a price through the roof. And we saw that with the Volkswagen squeeze in 2008. So Volkswagen was not doing great. Um, and this was right near during uh, the housing bubble crisis, right? 2008. And Somebody else is in the room. Uh, they just gonna have to wait till next time. <laughs> um, yeah. So during the housing bubble, you had the the stock market crash because a lot of loans were going into default. People weren't be able to pay them back, and the the banks they they had to go into bankruptcy. Right. You saw. I can't remember the names of the banks. Uh, you probably remember better than me, but some of the big boys they went under. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and. So the banks, when they're going on there, like a lot of these hedge funds that were borrowing uh, shares, the banks, as they were trying oh, to scramble yeah. to find Goldman, Goldman, Goldman Sachs, Sachs was running that. Yeah. 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 yeah, Goldman Sachs. They called up these hedge funds like, hey, you remember when you borrowed those shares? Yeah, I'm going to need you to pay that back now because we're having issues. So at, at the same time as the stock market was going down, like the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones, at the same time, Volkswagen shot up through the roof. Nobody was buying cars, right? But yet somehow the stock price of Volkswagen just went through the roof. And that was the reason, right? Short interest, right? So the same thing just happened last February, 2021 with AMC, the movie theater chain, mm -hmm. and then GameStop, the, uh, the video game company. GameStop was uh, a dead man walking, but yet they got shorted to the ground and this group called Wall Street Bets on, on Reddit. I don't know if you've heard of Reddit before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Wall Street Bets is a sub form on Reddit. And it's, it's just a whole bunch of people that go in there. I think they might have 8 million people in the Reddit, which is crazy. And they just talk about stocks and whatnot. Not necessarily even good investors. Like they're just, you know. 8 million? Whew, yeah. A lot, yeah. So all of them came together and said, they, they tracked these big hedge funds and they looked at what, what are the hedge funds, what are the, the companies that they're shorting the most? What are, the, what, are the, their, what are their holdings where they have the most short interest at? And they, they made a, a, a list. They made a little Christmas list for all these things. And they included Bed Back and Beyond, AMC, GameStop, a few others, uh, Bath and Body Works, Beyond Meat, like a bunch of these different stocks. And they said, okay, what would happen if, when the, when the price is pushed down to, let's say, $5, it's so something ridiculously low, right? Something that is so low, it doesn't even make sense because we're shorting it to the ground. What happens if we came in and we scooped up all the stock? We scooped up 90% of the, the, the free float of all the shares that are out there for GameStop, right? So all the, the regular retail investors came in and scooped up like 90% of the actual stock that was out there. And then 
um, they they got margin call all the big hedge funds and they couldn't buy back the stock on their own. So they were, they were forced to sell it back at a price that they didn't want to. Mm. So they might have shorted it down to to five dollars. If five dollars are shorting it down, but then the price is going up to seven, eight, nine, because all these real retail, retail investors are buying in seven, eight, nine, ten. And they're like, well, we're still not going to cover. We're still not, they'll give up eventually. And they didn't. Then the price went up to 20, then 40. Mm. Wow. And then you know how far in the hole you are. You know, $20, $40 to $5 is not a big deal. When you multiply that by a million shares, <laughs> that becomes a big deal at that point. And you're talking about billions of dollars of losses in, in shares that you don't even own, that you have to buy back, right? So the price eventually, it went up to $70. It pulled back to like $40 for a week. And then it shot up from $40 to like $500. You can imagine, so there was one hedge fund, uh, I think from the UK, they, they went out of business because of that. They got killed by that short squeeze. They were completely unprepared for that, right? So um, if you would have gotten in at $5, if you bought in as a retail investor, you could have become a millionaire overnight. But if you bought in at $500, just because your barber told you, hey, this this thing is flying up, you know, going to it. And um, you got in at the top or you got late to the party. And then, you know, everybody starts selling. Now, all of a sudden you bought in at $500 and then it dropped back down to a hundred. Then a lot of people that got in late, they lost a lot of money. So it's like, mm -hmm. <sighs> do your due diligence, do your research. If there's nothing else you take from anything in life, always do your research. Do not like take somebody's first word for something. Right? That's speculation. Mm -hmm. Know the risk before you get into it. That's cool if you know the risk. If you have some play money set aside that you can take that risk, cool. But if that's bill money, if that's rent money, if that's your college trust fund money, do not throw that into lottery plays and gamble with it because mm. stupid play stupid games, you'll win stupid prizes. <laughs> All right. So, okay. so that's that's the way to kind of like look at these different mm -hmm. stocks and read them. Order flow who's buying, who's not buying, institutional holdings, what are the big boys doing, uh, news, what are the catalysts, is there a new iPhone coming out that might make the stock price fly up, right? Look at the news, um, look at the price targets, and then look at the financials. What, what is the company doing? Do they use your money well? Are they losing money or are they gaining money each quarter? Like, see, who's their CEO? Do they have a guy who's or, or, or a woman who's a great CEO, or do you have somebody with a tinfoil hat on? Like you need to like mm -hmm. look at the basics. And then once you have like good confidence in the basics, the fundamentals in the company, then you can say, okay, these are my price targets. And then this is where I will buy and sell at. You have confidence when you make a move, mm. right? And then mm. all, the, all the technical indicators, those are just like different little added layers of nuance to like make you more and more confident in your choice. But mm -hmm. you should have a certain mm -hmm. baseline of confidence. Like even if you knew nothing about all these numbers and charts and indicators, if you have an Apple phone and you believe in a company, you know they make good computers, you know they make good moves, decisions, they, they constantly have good long-term growth, then that means bam, this is something that I will invest in and I'll feel confident about it. If it drops down a little bit in the short term, I'm not going to freak out because I know five years from now it will be higher it, it will reach a certain price target. So you, you mm -hmm. don't get tripped out by the good and the bad in the short term because you have confidence over the long term that it will trend in the direction you want it to. Um, so, wow. wow. Okay, thanks This has a lot. been good. This has been good. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. No doubt. Um, before I let you guys go, I'll go briefly through these, these top ones that I'm going to put up in the chat. Um, so I went over VTI, that's the total stock market. Uh, VOO, that's the Vanguard S&P 500. And um, let's see, do, 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 do. Let's go to the Weeble, look up VOO. S&P 500, and then we'll go open up. News. See. 
I'll be able to bring it up better next time. I'm so used to doing it on my phone. It's just different on the mm-hmm. app. But point being, they have a lot of the top companies, again, like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, the big boys. Um, mm-hmm. My third one that I have that I picked up is the Vanguard information technology one. So that's going to have your, your Teslas, um, your Apples, Facebook, um, Square, Zoom, like a lot of the information technology ones that either do good long-term or some of the ones that popped up in the short term, like Zoom, which we're on, just flew off the charts during the pandemic, came out of nowhere. So that's- right. Wow. Well, yeah, that's yeah. VGT, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. VGT. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can see right now, I bought in at 356 and even with all the fluctuation in the market, I think right now my return is around like, mm, like six and a half percent. So it's been a pretty strong holding for me. Mm-hmm. Um, fourth one is my real estate one, VNQ. And that's a Vanguard real estate uh, ETF. Uh, I can't remember the the uh, the real estate companies that are in it, but they have a lot of good ones. Um, mm-hmm. you can see the return on that. This one is really good as well. This percentage right here is the percentage that I'm up from the time that I bought it. So this is the price that I averaged in at $94. And this is the current price. So I'm up about 9.65%. Um, my fifth one is my Vanguard high dividend one. So this one is VYM and it will have things that give good dividends like Procter & Gamble, um, Visa, um, Apple. And they tend to <clears throat> give high dividends even when their price is lower than expected for that quarter. They still give you kind of like a, a fixed rate, which you which would you say mm-hmm. dividends. So the dividends for this are like three dollars every three months or every year for each stock. So they're a really high dividend one. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my sixth one is, and you can see how I've been like diversifying the different sectors here as well. The sixth one is Vanguard Utilities ETF, and this one will always do good because people will always pay their gas yeah. bills, light bills, water, like those things will always be getting paid, right? So this yeah, one, have to have those, right? Yeah, this one's up 14% even with all the volatility because lights will be getting paid or they won't be on, right? So, so those are my top six. So you can see here are some other ones I have like um, these ADT and CX were free. So I don't not really, I'm not really taking a loss on it because they were given to me for free. Uh, mm-hmm. still way Ray one is a cannabis stock. So this one, I have a $15 loss on or 49%, but you can see, I'm not really heavily weighted with that one. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I would say about 60% to 70% of my money is in these top six. So I would say 60% of your money should be in your foundation stocks. Uh, maybe 10 to 20% of your money should be in individual stocks. So maybe like an Apple or Microsoft, you know, things that are not like in a fund, but they are stocks that you believe in, Mm -hmm. Apple stocks. And then you have 20% left, then maybe another 10% could be more high risk plays like stocks or or short-term buy, right? Maybe like a swing tree. So like the other 20% of your, portfolio, even if things did not go your way within, with a, uh, a short-term buy or an option or, or, or a speculation play like AMC, it's not going to crush your account because this will be your flagship. This will be the brick and mortar foundation of your portfolio. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, next time we'll go into the technical analysis and not whatnot, but these are the basics for, for those that are going to come back and, and rewatch the video. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stan. Appreciate it. All righty. Enjoy the weekend. You too.